So hello, everyone. Uh, two minutes past, I think we'll, we'll get things slowly underway. I'm Adam Hug. I'm director of the Foreign Policy Centre here in a virtual London. Uh, um, and we're obviously live uh, with people from around uh, not only uh, Tajikistan and Central Asia, but across to uh, across Europe and, and the United States as well today. Um, so we are here to talk about uh, the situation in Tajikistan. Uh, the Foreign Policy Centre has launched this morning uh, a new publication that brings together a range of different experts, both local, diasporan and international, to look who are looking at different aspects of uh, the current human rights and governance situation in Tajikistan from a range of different angles. And I'm delighted that I'm joined by uh, four of those contributors today. Um, I'm not going to say very much at the beginning because uh, if you read, if you start the publication at the beginning, you'll, you'll get quite a lot from me up front uh, explaining how I see the situation. But I'll, I'll chip in during the uh, the Q and A. But the general the general overview is that the situation on the ground is extremely challenging. Um, and it has got, yeah, as, as, as any most observers will have known, it has got progressively challenge, more challenging year on year. And we'll get into some of those details later, but there are, you know, it's huge human rights and governance challenges, issues with corruption um, and pressure on um, minority communities um, that we will be uh, discussing today. Um, and I'm joined by a great panel. Uh, Dr. Pavlis Molojanov, who is a visiting researcher at the School of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences based in Paris. Uh, Shorya Olimova, who is a community organizer and activist with the International Accountability Project. Uh, Dilbar Turakanova, um, who is an independent consultant uh, focused on gender equality issues. And Dr. Edward Lemon, who is a research assistant professor at the Bush School of Government. Uh, in Washington and the founder of the Oxus Society, um, and he's also an FBC senior fellow. Um, so we've got a great group of people uh, who are expert on Tajikistan to talk through things with us today. So I will get, uh, so but, but before I uh, let Parvis get a, our discussion underway, so I'm going to say we're going to be using the question and answer function for when we get to the questions after people's initial comments. So please, as we're going along, put your questions in the Q&A box uh, so that we can pick them up um, and discuss them. So, um, and it's uh, this this meeting is on the record, um, and uh, it's also available on Facebook Live as well as Zoom. So, um, I will, without any further ado, uh, hand over to Parviz uh, to get our discussion underway today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my task uh, today is to discuss the issue of uh, civil society, the role of civil society, and the phenomenon of revitalization of the civil society during and after the pandemic in Tajikistan, which is a uh, uh, very interesting phenomenon. Uh, it's not a unique one because you can uh, envisage, you can observe uh, the, the same scale, uh, sudden increase in activities of the non-governmental sector, uh, uh, which of course it looks, looks quite unusual for developing countries. Uh, with the economies in transition, but uh, you can see that uh, such phenomenon is observed in many countries today, uh, especially in, uh, in uh, hybrid uh, democracies, democracies in authoritarian countries, because there is uh, uh, also it's kind of response to uh, unpreparedness of the government to deal with the new uh, economic and social challenges affiliated with and caused by the uh, pandemics. Uh, this uh, phenomenon, is, uh, phenomenon is observed in many other post-Soviet countries, uh, uh, such as Belarus, uh, where the uh, government, uh, uh, government denial policy also led to revitalization of the civil society and eventually led the country to large-scale anti-government uprising. Uh, in Tajikistan, this phenomenon has its own specifics. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this phenomenon is also caused by the denial policy undertaken by the government. The reason of this denial policy uh, is, uh, first of all, because the country, the government, wanted to build some sort of uh, uh, collective immunity or health immunity. Uh, following the Swedish example, uh, the 
difference between the Swedish model and Tajik model was not mainly in the implementation style. Uh, the Swedish model envisaged uh, a wider involvement of publics, uh, wider dissemination of information, sharing the pluses and minuses, discussion, public discussion, deliberation, which wasn't the case in the Tajik case. Uh, in the in Tajikistan, the approach was uh, different. The implementation was uh, following the style, uh, the managed, uh, the, the solid uh, management style, which created uh, uh, serious uh, problems and challenges for the government. And the main challenge was uh, the both mentioned uh, civil society revitalization, which. Uh, in, uh, uh, occurred in three main stages. So the first stage was uh, informational campaign in social networks undertaken by the uh, variant, uh, various actors ranging from individuals, individual bloggers, uh, civic organization, just uh, ordinary activists, individuals, uh, just to fill the gap uh, in, in the vacuum in informational flow uh, in the country, because uh, the government was covering uh, the data uh, for almost three months. Uh, uh, the government uh, refused, totally refused uh, the uh, existence of uh, COVID-19 uh, in the country. It refused, uh, it refused any uh, cases of uh, uh, infection in, in, uh, in various regions of the country. And of course, it, uh, because it was actually contradicting to the, uh, what people were seeing. And therefore, it caused uh, a wider response from the civil society. And civil society started to uh, its activities, its information campaign, covering the gap, uh, uh, presenting and offering uh, new data, uh, alternative data to society, uh, organizing and monitoring the situation, creation of new social um, uh, websites, uh, new social networks, uh, various uh, pages on the internet just to cover these uh, uh, mistakes of the government. The, uh, the, uh, the next stage was uh, practical activities, meaning that creation of the volunteer groups uh, uh, mainly also in social networks, but also inside the country. And these uh, volunteer groups were engaged in collecting humanitarian aid, uh, donations, uh, medicine, food, uh, different kind of equipment, uh, and offering them to you know, various uh, uh, socially vulnerable groups of people, to poor people, to people infected, to um, uh, hospitals, uh, to physicians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What is uh, the, uh, the new phenomenon? Also, uh, an important aspect is that uh, it uh, involved a number of new actors, which now have been active in social and political activities. Uh, this first of all, migrant stations, uh, various diasporas. Uh, which played a special role in those activities. They organized large-scale fundraising, humanitarian assistance. They launched a program of uh, helping uh, migrant families, uh, helping migrants inside Russia, helping their families uh, in, uh, inside the country. So this uh, new uh, groups uh, covered, uh, uh, also involved a number of uh, newcomers, uh, ranging from students, workers, migrant groups, who have never been involved in such activities as I mentioned. So it was also a very important phenomenon for the country. Uh, um, in, in other words, we can conclude that actually it was uh, an attempt of the civil society to fill the gap uh, in informational uh, activities of the government, also in the government practical response to the COVID-19 challenge. Uh, how the government responded uh, uh, to this new phenomenon? First, the government has launched a, a counter-narrative information campaign, uh, which includes several aspects.
first of all, they tried to diminish the, diminish the achievements of, of uh, volunteer movements. Uh, uh, the uh, official media also launched a uh, uh, wide campaign, informational campaign, to popularize uh, the activities of the government, various governmental institutions, also to popularize the humanitarian aid, leg allegedly uh, rendered by different kind of uh, uh, official uh, organizations in the country. Uh, another uh, aspect was uh, to put to pressure on the most critically minded uh, commentators and media resources. And the most bright, the brightest example of this pressure is Radio Zodi, which in April to, uh, 20, 2020 reached an international level uh, because uh, um, uh, there was uh, a series of uh, letters signed by several senators, U.S. Uh, uh, senators criticizing the government approach and the government um, pressure on Radio Ozodi, uh, Radio Liberty. And there was also uh, uh, a special decree issued by the government uh, ensuring the uh, declaring the responsibility for the disseminating uh, unconfirmed information and provoking panic in, uh, among the country. The, and uh, this uh, decree was used also as a pretext um, uh, background uh, to uh, undertake such pressure against uh, different kinds of uh, activists within uh, social networks. Uh, in order to prevent politicization of uh, the volunteer movement, the Tajik law enforcement uh, and security bodies uh, have enhanced their activities abroad to neutralize the political opposition uh, that took refuge in several EU countries. Also, they uh, undertaken uh, uh, serious efforts to Due uh, to to reduce the activities of volunteer groups in uh, Moscow and other uh, diasporas abroad, uh, uh, the government was really concerned by this new phenomenon, and the government was afraid of its uh, further politicization. Uh, what was uh, the uh, outcome of? Uh, this uh, phenomenon, what we observe today. First of all, we observe uh, the certain uh, process of uh, politicization of volunteer movement and civic activities in general, uh, because uh, uh, the pandemic and related socioeconomic consequences is proved to be a long-term phenomenon. And uh, it implies that uh, First of all, uh, the government response uh, would take a uh, longer time and especially and the response from the civil society would be on uh, the same scale. Second, the uh, politicization and uh, the first manifestation of the politicization of civic protest was already observed uh, uh, several years ago during the first phase of the economic crisis. 2014-2017, and uh, after that, the uh, civic uh, uh, resentment and discontent was gradually accumulated in the Tajik society, and especially in migrant diasporas abroad. And uh, today, we observe just uh, uh, a, a, uh, an explosion. We can say the civic explosion would. Frequently assumes also um, political character. Uh, this uh, um, uh, public discontent uh, was unleashed recently after the arrest of uh, and deportation of Izat Amun, one of the uh, leading civic uh, activists in Moscow, head of the Center for Tajiks in Moscow. So his arrest. Uh, was a kind of trigger which uh, launched uh, this uh, uh, process of uh, 
е сивик как се положим. Next phase of productization of the сивик movement and volunteer movement and also productization of in general civil society. What would be the conclusion? I mean, what we should expect in the future? And what would be the scale and degree of uh, this phenomenon of uh, politicization of uh, public protest? It depends on the government, first of all, on the government itself, on how the government would shape its future response to economic and uh, social crisis, how it shape response to COVID-19 challenge and other challenge related challenges, what tactics and strategy would be chosen, uh, to resolve those challenges. And uh, most likely that uh, to a certain degree, the civil society um, um, would be, uh, I mean, this uh, process of uh, its uh, revitalization would be continued. And most probably a part, at least a part of this uh, uh, civil society groups would be politicized to one degree or another. And the decision, uh, the question is whether uh, this growing uh, revitalization and politicization of civil society, uh, uh, this trend would involve a considerable part of the population or only a smaller part of it. And also, uh, um, for I mean, what would be the scale of the government response? Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavis. Um, I, I think obviously what you've outlined over COVID is a it, it is, is a sort of very similar to as you said the, the the times we've seen before when there was an economic crisis. Uh, the you know, you know, civil society activism uh, in this in in, in, in Traditional civil society activism has been cracked down on very hard for the last couple of years. Uh, in particular, obviously, you have a number of leg organizations that are still being able to be on the ground, but having to keep ve within very tight lines, not to um, face uh, threat of closure or worse from the government. And obviously, you've seen these these civil these new movements appearing on social media that are informally filling those gaps where to go into play to gaps that the state's left. Um, and if you want to see some of the other stuff on, on, on the COVID response, do look at Sebastian Peruz's uh, essay in our collection on that. But also, but then once those gaps have been identified, it's the question of how far and how, so how, how far civil society is willing to go, given the risks of repression that have been made very, very clear over the last couple of years, um, whether you're in Tajikistan or, as you say, in the diaspora, um, who uh, have not been safe from targeting. Um, Okay, so lots of really interesting things that I'm sure we'll get into more in the Q&A section. Um, I'm delighted now to bring in uh, Shoira. Thank you, Adam. Hi, everyone. Um, I would like to ask then uh, Foreign Policy Center representatives to share my presentation. I'm Shoira Olimova, and I represent International Accountability Project uh, which is the International Human and Environmental Rights Organization uh, that works with uh, civil societies, communities, and social movements to change how today's development is done. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Foreign Policy Center for making a great job uh, for creation this uh, masterpiece uh, Tajikistan spotlight and collect all the materials, all the ideas and the uh, issues around the Tajikistan, starting from political issues and ending to the human rights and some specific sector issues. And this is good. Uh, I just uh, open the send link and uh, look through all of them. It's perfect. And uh, I think it's uh, indeed uh, in time was done the document which, uh, con which consists of all the relevant and important issues around the Tajikistan. Well, um, my paper, um, my essay for this Tajikistan spotlight is called The Broken Promises of Development in Tajikistan. And uh, the, main, uh, the main context of the next slide, please, Bobby. 
And the context of the, uh, this paper is uh, based on the state of development in Tajikistan's overall overview and the cycle of corruption and poorly designed project information. Also, some glance on the, at the absence of transparency and the access to information. Of course, COVID-19 relief and projects as an actual program and relevant for now and prioritizing people-centered development rather than other investment. This is some kind of context. Uh, we all know, uh, next, next slide please. We all know about um, <clears throat> Tajikistan situation and we know that it's one of the least developed countries among Central Asia and ex-Soviet Union countries. But nevertheless, uh, it's really uh, favorable for foreign investors, including those from China, Russia, Kazakhstan, United Kingdom, United States. Even if you notice for now, China has replaced Russia as the largest investor, and uh, we are considered to be one of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative project. Uh, here is some examples uh, regarding of um, China's investment and that uh, uh, Eighty percent of gold fields all operated by Chinese companies right now in Tajikistan. And uh, just for your information, next slide, please. Just for your information, our organization, uh, International Accountability Project, um, deals with monitoring all the investment around the world, including Tajikistan, uh, as a developing country. And um, according to our statistics, uh, out of fifteen. Uh, develop finance institutions whom we are making monitoring, whom we are checking, and we have a uh, project tablers with a project tracking. Um, that for Tajikistan, six uh, development finance institutions are investing right now, starting from ADB, World Bank, EBRD, AIB, BPAs, and IFAS. And you can see from this uh, table, uh, just for overall information, this is data from 1st January to 3rd June. Uh, of previous year. Uh, right now, Uzbekistan, among all the Central Asian countries, considered to be dominated in terms of getting more investing, investment by development finance institutions. You see it's 94 projects for uh, seven, 7 billion, uh, more than 7 billion. And Tajikistan um, uh, have got 50, 54 for 1 billion, more than 1 billion. And next slide, please. Um, from uh, from August 1st, 2019 to February 2021, in Tajikistan, it was implemented, it was invested 41 projects for more than 1 billion, according to our uh, system tracking, which is called uh, early warning system. This is one of the main program of our organization which deals with um, database collection of all the investment projects in all the, over the world. Also, we are dealing with uh, uh, civil society organization for exchanging the tools, information, and uh, how to deal with the development in the current situation. Next, please. As I mentioned before, um, uh, among uh, all the development finance institutions right now in Tajikistan, mostly investors considered to be World Bank, EDB, uh, EBRV, AIB, uh, DPS, and IFS. And the main financing by sectors, you can see from the tableau, it's energy sector, transport, water and sanitation, law and government, finance, health issues, and etc. However, as you see from the uh, other tableau, the main sector for investment is considered to be energy and transport sector. Uh, here is, um, I think I shared through the just a minute, I will share through the chat. You can see and open, this is uh, our project tracking tableau. You can see all the investment around the world, including Tajikistan, just going by the map and clicking to needed requested country. And you can see all the information around the investment projects, uh, last information for this year. And we are updating this tableau for each three months. Uh, if you need more information, there are at the below, you can see project list information. And by clicking to that page, you, you can go and see uh, some general information about uh, requested projects. Well, uh, next uh, example. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned before, 
Uh, the main sector for now is considered to be uh, energy and transport sector. Everybody knows about the energy situation in Tajikistan, right? For almost 30 years after independence, Tajikistan has been struggling, still struggling with the, to achieve energy security, particularly in the winter period. Even this year, despite the COVID situation, uh, we have a lot of limits, uh, especially in outside in villages. It was huge, uh, very, very cold winter for this year. However, um, we still have a facing a lot of uh, challenges with energy problems. Uh, though the data from early warning system, uh, uh, the system data shows that since August 2019, development banks have proposed investment totally over 320 million USD to support the energy sector alone to Tajikistan. And all this uh, investment goes through uh, energy agency called Barfigogic. Everybody knows about this. But despite to this, uh, you know, everybody knows that uh, Barfitojik uh, every year trying, uh, how to say, spontaneously uh, making shortage with energy and uh, making limits on energy use in the uh, while prioritizing export to neighboring Afghanistan and Uzbekistan. Mm, so uh, next, please. And also at the cycle of corruptions part of the uh, my SC, there was some information about the widespread corruption and fraud for the effectiveness of uh, different kind of development initiatives and projects. There are some examples, case studies, uh, uh, some situation happening with the project implementation. And we see that uh, investment and the project's implementation mostly goes uh, via widespread of corruptions and frauds. Uh, next, please. Yeah, in the part of the absence of transparency and access of to information, I would like to say that um, despite to a large sums of investment, right, uh, still Tajik citizens, for Tajik citizens, it's difficult and often risky to request, request information about the project. Um, in most cases, from uh, a regional website, you can find the information in English, really in Russian, but you know that majority of Tajik people only speaks in uh, Russian and Tajik, and that's why it's difficult to find um, information in uh, Russian or in Tajik. Uh, also, we know that all the projects uh, financed by development banks are done in cooperation with the government agencies, right? And there is very little information made available for official state side or even upon request. People doesn't know about how many investment is coming, uh, that it's their rights to be interfered, their rights is to request uh, for any kind of information, especially for civil societies. However, we still have a lack in this uh, uh, process and we see that um, not always uh, access to information is available. Therefore, communities and civil societies do not have access to information about the development project, country strategy, investment and debts. Next, please. Regarding of COVID situation, here is another uh, another tabloid. Sorry for a, a bit more tabloids. Uh, according to our data for this period, eight projects have been done in terms of COVID for more than one billion, and uh, this the main uh, providers from development finance institutions for the COVID. It's uh, ADB, World Bank, and EBRD. And you see the sector, it comes, all the investment comes for health sector, for reform, reform of the government or some other agencies, transport and uh, finance, and then uh, a little bit for water and sanitation. Next, please. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, COVID-19 situation is also considered to be uh, one of the main projects. Uh, uh, and the, a lot of investment comes from these projects uh, related to the COVID. But despite to, uh, a lot of funds and resources, we see the real situation as Parviz Molojanov also mentioned, most Tajik citizens are unable, unable to freely access much needed supplies like masks or thermometer, thermometers. Or uh, in the hospitals, the situation was very terrible during that situation. Uh, 
we cannot see uh, reliable or a valid information about the number of infection people and number of dead people because uh, government uh, government figures the number infection and uh, casualties are very hard to trust without independent verification. And uh, but at the same time, we have seen at that period that some activists um, feeling that there is a lack of information. Uh, try to make some kind of uh, tracking uh, and uh, find uh, real information about the death infection on social media, but this initiative was promptly uh, shut down. Next, please. Um, oh, by the way, I upload from my own experience that during that pandemic situation, it was exactly last year, uh, Tajikistan TV, instead of providing information about the prophylactic, about the COVID situation around the world, and including Tajikistan situation, it was much more uh, programs devoted to um, uh, films, documentary films about the pre pre President Rahman and his political achievements. During that period, we have much more broadcast. I, I have watched a lot of documentary movies about our history rather than COVID situation. And recently, uh, during the press conference uh, with Ministry of Health, it was announced that all infected people have been treated for free as a hospital. And uh, since December 2020, there haven't any been uh, any case of COVID-19 infected persons identified. And of course, this statement uh, starkly contradicts the experience of public citizens who continue to deal with the fellows of this crisis. Crisis. Next, please. Well, and then uh, SE ends with uh, some kind of recommendation around the investments, and uh, uh, it seems like uh, instead of <clears throat> investing uh, to energy transfer in other sectors, it would be good also for development finance institution together with the government. Uh, to shift from investing uh, from these sectors to main and best uh, asset with the people, because the capacity of the people needs for more development in order to deal with a lot of issues, and we still have a lack uh, in this uh, process. And uh, Tajik citizens have been unable to fully and freely participate in the decisions that will shape their homes, lives, and futures. As we see, all this project is done in terms of uh, development, development for a nation. But as a reality, we see that in most cases, all these invest investments come uh, as a main benefit, I don't know, as a main profit for some specific people rather than other people. Therefore, um, after all, the experience of communities and civil societies worldwide have demonstrated that when projects are designed and lived by the same people, if other people contribute in um, this kind of uh, project drafting, in this kind of project proposals, of course, uh, there will be a lot of uh, uh, a lot of priorities and a lot of avoiding of uh, uh, this kind of corruptions and frauds, and much more given uh, preference to rights uh, to of the people. This is all. I think I've done. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of our recommendations, and I'll put the recommendations in the chat in a minute, um, but, but, yeah, is we do need to think about where international money is coming into uh, Tajikistan to see if it's make sure it's getting the best impact. I mean, I'll, as as one of the questions I know we're going to get to in the Q and A section is about the role of China, and obviously yeah. that is the biggest investor uh, in, in in certain sectors. But there is, as as Troy has, Troy has highlighted, there significant um, IFI and Western money that's coming in into certain sectors and we want to make sure that you know wherever possible that money isn't being diverted to um certain um things close to the family uh, or, or or displacing money from the system that would otherwise go uh that might well end up in those uh, uh in those ways so there's a lot of i think there is a lot of opportunity for greater scrutiny of IFI investment uh, in Tajikistan, and you've identified a number of ways you can do that, and particularly by giving information to local people to help do that scrutiny on the ground uh, wherever possible. So that's really, really important, and we'll come to that more in, in the Q&A. And on the Q&A, please do feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box now, and we will get to them as soon as uh, we finish with the initial comments. I'm delighted now to bring in uh, Dilba. 
Thank you, Adam. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Good uh, afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, in in uh, this contribution of the brief on Tajikistan, uh, my topic concerned women's political participation. And uh, in assessing the situation, I use mainly CEDO, the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination of All Forms of uh, discrimination of all forms of discrimination against women as a point of reference and i also use the framework of political participation which is established in the article 7 of this um, international treaty uh, specifically i looked only at the right to be elected and also at the right to participate uh, to hold public office and perform all public functions. So I didn't touch upon the topic of uh, participation uh, in the NGOs and through the NGOs. Uh, so my, my uh, essay mainly looks uh, into the women's political participation from percep perception of legislation, whether it enables women to participate, whether it takes into account the actual situation of women. And also I look through the political statements and policies, whether they are promoting, in fact, uh, women's political participation. So I didn't have enough space to talk uh, broadly about situation of women. So I used as a point of reference also internationally comparable indices which measure gender equality. And if we look at these indices, uh, one of the most uh, often ci oftenly cited is a global gender gap ranking of the World Economic Forum. And we could see that Tajikistan ranks lowest in this uh, ranking compared to other Central Asian countries. And if we look at the dimensions, because the measure, uh, the index is a, comp is a composite measure of four dimensions, Tajikistan ranks uh, lowest in the economic participation and opportunity and political participation followed by education. So the, uh, so we could see from this uh, measuring that Tajikistan, in, in Tajikistan, women do not enjoy equal rights to participate in politics and economic, uh, in the labor market, etc., and in the, in the education. Another measure which I uh, also took um, as a point of reference is the gender development index because it looks whether men and women enjoy equally human development. I will not uh, go into details. I will only mention um, one figure in terms of uh, gross national income. Women have. Uh, uh, four, four and a half times lower uh, gross national income compared to men. So, which means that they're particularly economically disadvantaged what, uh, that is confirmed by these both indices. And uh, in my essay, I also looked at the issue of women's political participation from perspective of the anti-discrimination law, which is being drafted now as part of the implementation of recommendations which were given to Tajikistan uh, uh, in the framework of universal periodic review of human rights. And why, why I'm doing this? Because uh, in, uh, in Tajikistan, uh, there is a law on state guarantees of equal rights of women and men and equal opportunities of their enjoyment. And in fact, it's the only law which uh, established a notion of discrimination in Tajikistan. And this law, uh, I will again not uh, explain in details because you, could, you can read it for the purpose of time saving. But this law has several critical gaps. First of all, it, it is not compliant with the requirement of CEDAW to establish a uh, notion of discrimination which is inclusive of uh, gender-based discrimination and explicitly recognizes intersecting forms of discrimination and prohibits it. Besides, uh, it does not follow the framework of CEDAW, which speaks about prohibition of discrimination in recognition, uh, enjoyment, and exercise of rights. So our law speaks only about recognition, and it does not include direct and indirect discrimination, and does not pro protect from intersectional discrimination. It does not include uh, temporary special measures, and there are no any measures foreseen to eliminate existing social and cultural patterns on the role of women, uh, which perpetuate also discrimination against women. So why anti-discrimination law? Because so this law, this draft law, which has been drafted in a participatory manner, um, established a definition which is uh, uh, in full compliance with the CEDAW intersectionality perspective. It also speaks about positive measures, including 
temporary special measures which are aimed at remedy the, and remedying the situations of uh, discrimination. It also uh, explicitly defines direct and indirect discrimination. And as I said, calls for adoption of positive measures. So from pure legalistic perspective, this is a very prominent or, and very useful law to boost political participation of women. Uh, in my essay, I asked the question whether this law is sufficient for uh, boosting political participation of women. And uh, my answer is uh, no, because uh, political participation of women is a result of combination of factors. So there is a need to look also at social and political discourses, at the political structures and institutions and social, cultural and functional constraints that limit women's individual and collective agency. So it's, a, it's not just a law which makes women uh, uh, to participate in politics equally with men, but it's a, a general environment which should be set up in the country to ensure that women participate equally with men in the politics. And looking uh, uh, into the women's political par participation from this perspective, in my essay, I argue that uh, Unfortunately, our gender, our um, legislation, which gives women uh, and men the right to vote uh, uh, and be elected is uh, gender neutral. Uh, and uh, I, uh, in, in our legislation on elections to the parliament, especially lower chamber, there are two requirements for running for elections. One is election deposit. And second is higher education. Both requirements are applicable to women and men, so they're gender neutral. But in fact, they place women into disadvantaged position compared to men. And uh, specifically the CEDO, when it made uh, its uh, review of uh, implementation of CEDO by Tajikistan recommended to fully withdraw a deposit fee. And OECE also made an assessment after, um, actually after every election, so um, after observing every election that requirement of higher education is all, also overly restrictive for both women and men. But if we'll again uh, go back into the assessment of uh, uh, gender equality from the perspective of international industries, we could see that uh, such requirements put women into particular disadvantaged situation and they have a disproportionate impact of women. So we could not say that this gender, that our legislation is um, promoting women's participation. What about the situation uh, in the reality? And I will look uh, again into the policy. There are two policies in Tajikistan which uh, focus specifically on promote women into leadership and management positions. And this policy set up a target of reaching 30% of participation of women in the, um, uh, in the political uh, field. But unfortunately, this target is very low from international, again, perspective, if we look at the commitment taken by Tajikistan, also the Beijing platform of action, which is, uh, okay, not legally binding, but it's a programmatic document. This target has to be reached by Tajikistan by 1995. And if we look at the situation in 2021, this target is uh, not uh, even, we are not even close into this target. So if we look at participation of women in the parliament, we could see that in the upper chamber, women made up 25.8%. And in the lower chamber, after last elections in 2020, women made up 23.8%. At the decision-making level, if we look at the ministerial post, women uh, hold only two posts out of uh, 14 ministers, and these are traditional um, areas where women are being appointed in Tajikistan, it's labor, employment, and migration posts and the uh, Minister of Culture. And uh, at the higher level positions, uh, women are also appointed usually at the post of Vice Prime Minister responsible of social affairs. So they are appointed into traditionally, um, in the traditional sectors where women also make up a majority of uh, civil servants and employees. So if we look at the civil service, so we see even negative indicators because if we compare the situation with 2030, uh, the participation of women at the, in the civil service decreased from 35.2% to 23.8%. And um, uh, if we look again at the judiciary, 
we can see that also 30% uh, target is below reach, is out of reach, sorry. Uh, in judiciary, we, okay, we have now one uh, uh, post, uh, chairperson of the Supreme Economic Court. It's occupied by a woman. But uh, in, for instance, in the constitutional po court, only one position of seven posts of judges is uh, occupied by women. And in the economic court, women only make up 15% of all uh, posts. And in the uh, court of general ju jurisdiction, it's below 20%. Uh, and uh, talking about political statements and policies, uh, what we see in Tajikistan is uh, uh, also what we see at the global agenda arena now that uh, Tajikistan's government is taking a conservative uh, strand in the, um, in the gender equality issues. Because for instance, if we look at the symbolic uh, celebration of uh, International Women's Day on March 8th, it was renamed into the Mother's Day. And um, and the, and when it was renamed, it was linked into the three thousand old tradition, yes, of Aryan men who honor mothers and wives during spring session seasons, and arguing that International Women's Day only has hundred years of history. And if we look at the, how president uh, is uh, formulating uh, the gender equality narrative. Then uh, in his uh, addresses, he's always speaking about women as uh, mothers, as educators of daughters, as main guardians of families and traditions. And uh, in the society where women are already regarded mainly as mothers and wives, uh, it puts women into a uh, disempowering position. And it also discourages women as girls from taking more proactive and leadership roles. Uh, so if we can just, uh, if I just summarize, then I will say that, okay. sorry, briefly, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, so the general political landscape is not supporting any meaningful participation of women and approaches towards gender equality are contradictory from one side legislation speaks about equality and from the other side, we see that statements are counter uh, counter, uh, give counter narrative. And uh, some of the recommendations which we are proposed, of course, adoption of anti discrimination law is absolutely required. But at the same time, this law should be supported by quotas, the use of quotas as a fast track strategy, which proves to be effective also internationally uh, to boost political participation of women. There is a need also to narrow gaps in economic participation and uh, opportunities of women and uh, uh, ensuring access of women to higher education. And of course, there is also a need to support all these measures with a large scale communication, information, and educational campaign to change gender stereotypes. That's all. Thank you. So that's all. There's quite a lot, quite a lot there to do, Jelba. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and, and also, no, 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 absolutely. And there's, a, yeah, we, we, our, our report also touches on issues around. Uh, Domestic violence, sexual harassment, the obviously life uh, life issues, and and also, um, I, and I think what one thing you said obviously about changing quotas inside legislation, I, given the uncompetitive un political environment in Tajikistan at the moment, there is scope within the party rules, presumably of the People's Democratic Party, to go further and faster if it's so wished without actually having to change the legislation uh, in order to promote women candidates to senior roles. Um, but we can get into that in the q and I'm delighted to now bring in Ed to round off the initial remarks. Um, but yes, as a reminder, please do put your uh, uh, questions in the Q&A box so we can get to them once Ed has finished speaking. Thanks very much. Uh, well, thank you, Adam, and thank you for the Foreign Policy Centre for, for the opportunity to contribute to another publication and to uh, join the discussion today. So sort of to wrap up the discussion, I'll talk a little bit about where we are, uh, building off some of the comments of the previous panelists and a little bit about the chapter that I contributed with Oleg Antonov and Parviz um, on academic freedom in Tajikistan, a topic that is of importance that is generally understudied and, and not um, drawn attention to from the human rights perspective. So where are we in 2021 in Tajikistan? Well, M. M. Mali Rahman has been head of state since 1992, November 1992, making him the longest serving head of state in the former Soviet Union. Authoritarian regimes are usually built on three pillars, co-optation, 
repression and legitimacy. And I think to build off of the comments already, Emmali Emmali Rahman's regime has built their regime uh, off these three pillars. So on the cooptation side, we've seen the emergence of a political and economic system that's dominated by the president's very extensive family and those who've married into that family who dominate um, key sectors of the economy through various businesses, winning, to speak to uh, Shoira's points around corruption, winning tenders from the government to build uh, infrastructure and, and to win investments in the mining sector, for example, in uncompetitive tenders. Um, we've seen them dominating the political system through obviously the president himself, but also his son and suspected heir, um, his eldest son, Rustam Emamali, who's been uh, mayor of Dushanbe, the capital city since 2017. We've seen Ozoda, his powerful daughter, it's also his chief of staff and various other members of his family taking key um, positions within, within, the, uh, within the political sector. So we've seen a regime that's built itself off this very strong family and, and extended family ties. Anyone who challenges that and attempts to become a competitive entrepreneur, for example, um, and eats into their interest can face um, criminal charges and others, other, other charges where the state is used to, to crack down upon, upon them. In terms of repression, we've seen a shift in the situation. I think a deterioration has been picked up by the other panelists. Certainly over the past decade, if not longer, if we think back a decade ago, we still had the Islamic Renaissance Party, um, the opposition party from the civil war that was brought into the government as part of the peace deal that was negotiated. We saw them um, as uh, with two seats in parliament, whose civil society was had a few fewer restrictions. The media was a little bit more open, but what have we seen in the past decade? We've seen a crackdown on various forms of independent media, as Parvi's picked up on with the, the uh, repression of Radio Azadi, Radio Free Europe's Tajik service, and various other independent media services being forced um, to either close or certainly to self sense We've seen lawyers being arrested um, for defending uh, political prisoners, um, such as Ozovmir um, Yorov back in 2015. And we've seen in 2015 the closure and uh, labeling of the Islamic Renaissance Party as a terrorist organization, pushing many of their members into exile and effectively ending this period of, of, of at least post uh, civil war um, reconciliation, where at least there was lip service paid to this agreement that ended the civil war. In terms of legitimacy, we've seen the government and Brahman becoming leader of the nation and president for life without term limits back in 20, well, 2014 into 2015 when there was the referendum. And we've seen, um, we've seen him consolidating power and framing himself as the person who brought peace to the country and, and unity and stability. And we've seen the civil war always being brought up as a specter of which, you know, if we if, if young people and, and Tajik citizens become too engaged in politics, if they, um, if they go out to protest, as, as Parvi's mentioned in his, his, his opening remarks, you know, what we will see as a return to the situation in 1992 and we'll see a return to violence. Look what's happened in Kyrgyzstan with three revolutions. Look what's happened in the, to the Arab Spring and what's happened in Syria as a result of, of, of those popular protests. So we've seen this concerted effort to um, construct the legitimacy of the government in many ways in, in negative terms, in terms of being, you know, the, the bringer of peace and stability, and effectively the only bulwark against um, the country deteriorating into chaos. So we've seen human rights obviously being widely affected. Of course, there are certain individuals and, and, and sectors that have been less affected, and of course, the country isn't as closed as countries like Turkmenistan, but we've certainly seen a deterioration in the past five years. The topic that um, myself, along with my colleagues, contributed to this volume was on academic freedom. Um, academic freedom is a cornerstone of university life. Um, universities should be places where people from a wide variety of backgrounds go to debate, discuss complex and contentious issues, um, offering different perspectives and solutions without fears of repercussions. Universities train skilled experts and technocrats who can contribute to the government. They also breed critical thinkers, right, who can solve problems. So they should be a place that benefits the government, right? They, they provide 
um, certain skill sets that are necessary to effective governments. But authoritarian regimes around the world have also viewed academics as a threat by virtue of being more critical of breeding this notions of freedom of expression and discussion and dialogue. They produce individuals, both students and also professors who can pose a threat to the regime. And so what we've seen emerge in Tajikistan is this dual dynamic of the regime using academics to reinforce its legitimacy on the one hand and also um, suppressing them and, and, and uh, closing down the spaces for the, their work um, if they become too critical. So we've seen what Elizabeth Perry describes in China as the scholar state nexus emerging. So in our uh, contribution, which is also an, a longer version of this is coming out in the uh, journal Central Asian Survey, it's part of a special issue probably sometime later, later this year, um, we look at three different dynamics of this process. We look at suppression, which is perhaps the most obvious when we think of academic freedom. The most obvious case we think back to is the case of Alexander Sadikov, PhD student from the University of Toronto, who was detained in June 2014 on espionage charges um, whilst we're working on a, a, a British-funded uh, research project on peace building in the country. We've seen you know, a number of other, other academics being arrested, individuals being denied permission um, or having restrictions on their mobility being able to go to international conferences or have international partnerships, particularly viewed as being problematic for the government and a potential threat to security. We've seen um, academics losing their job because they voiced too critical opinions or independent opinions. We've seen uh, independent universities in the country um, being closed down because they employed too many members of the opposition. And we've seen individuals, again, who were independent and critical being forced into exile. So we see the ground gradual closure of the space for academics to operate free. Of course, there are still individuals, as I said, and, 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 and different disciplines that are less affected by this. And certainly there is still some degree of, 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 the, of, of the ability to conduct research freely and express yourself freely, but certain topics, corruption, um, issues of Islamic extremism, um, governance, particularly of, by the president himself and top officials are no-go areas, not only for academics, of course, but also the journalists in many cases. Um, so we see the suppression of academia, but we also see its co-optation uh, and we see acquiescence, which is the second aspect we pick up on in, in our uh, chapter, um, where academics, because of the countervailing political situation, are forced to acquiesce, they're forced to practice self-censorship, um, restrict what they say and what topics they research. And we see the state education system being dominated, um, the education system, higher education system in the country being dominated by the state, um, state controlling accreditation of, of academics um, to gain their PhDs. We see the state um, appointing rectors to the universities in the country and 15 of those 40 rectors come from Hatlon in the south of the country. Four of the 40 rectors come from Dangara, which is the home district of the president, one of 58 districts in the country, just to put that into perspective, in the 58 districts and four of the 10% of the directors in the country come from this one district, which is the home district of the president uh, of the country. So there's certainly a degree of, of, of control and a lack of institutional autonomy that affects people's ability to speak freely. Um, lastly, we've seen academics being incorporated into this, into, into reinforcing the legitimacy of the authoritarian regime of, of, of MMR, MMR um, We've seen them becoming involved in, on the one hand, supporting the president when it comes to writing uh, opinion pieces or articles that are very praise, praising of him and, and, and the, the ruling family, for example, in President's Day, which celebrates the, the anniversary when Mali Rahman was elected um, chairman of the Supreme Soviet in November 1992. Um, and we see them um, also denigrating and criticizing the opposition. This is part of this broader um, Fabrikai Javob, or the Factory of the Answers, which is social media, picking up on Parbiz's early comments, the way in which the, the, the government uses effectively a troll factory. And there are around 400 individuals from the Ministry of Education, according to Radio Saudi, working in this troll factory that praises the government, criticizes the opposition, goes on social media posing as being independent and, and using uh, various fake accounts to, uh, to, to uh, help reinforce the government's power. So very briefly, I just want to get onto the Q&A. What, what can we do about this? 
Well, there are obviously a number of options that have been debated. Um, I think academic freedom, although it's understudied, is obviously of importance. You know, the closure of spaces for critical thinking hampers the development of the country, the development of skilled professionals and experts who can shape policy making and assist with development. It obviously also threatens freedom of expression and weakens the prospect for an engaged, developing an engaged citizenry who can keep the government accountable. So I think it's problematic that academic freedom is, has come under attack in the country. But what can we do about this? Um, there have been a number of uh, responses that have been debated, particularly those suggested back in 2018 by John Heathershaw and Ed, Edward Schatz in an op-ed for Open Democracy that was then led to a debate around different options. And so they, they posited three possible uh, policy options ranging from boycotting academic institutions um, uh, in, in terms of international partners boycotting uh, academic institutions. They also gave international partners the option to uh, blacklist specific academics or institutions that were deemed too close to the government or having problematic relations with them. And lastly, and probably the most productively and the, the, the option that we endorse in our, in our chapter and later in the longer article is this concept of critical engagement which is exercising caution in establishing partnerships with institutions in Tajikistan, and raising human rights concerns during those uh, interactions, um, making financial and other forms of cooperation between donors. And this maybe can also, is, is a concept that building off Shira's presentation should also be one that's being practiced by other forms of development actor, including IFIs, um, making financial and other forms of co cooperation um, conditional upon um, the involvement of independent scholars, think tanks, um, NGOs, and, and constantly raising the, these concerns through these interactions. So it's obviously a challenge and there's, um, it, it's a complex problem set, but they're some of the, the solutions that we posted. But with that, I'll conclude so we can move on to the Q&A. Thanks, Ed. Well, I mean, your, the point you've left us there is where I think we're going to jump into the Q&A. Um, and I think you please do add questions to the Q&A box um, for us to keep going with. Um, but the first, I'm going to take the first and fourth questions together because I think they can loop in together. So uh, Callum Wall asked, um, he was wondering whether you feel China's high level of investment in the country undermines potential Western sanctions over human rights in Tajikistan. Indeed, can any sanctions regime be effective if it does not unite all powers in its aims? And Dick Rogers has asked, what can the UK government do? And I think we can we can sort of answer those in different things. Not all speakers need to feel they need to answer all the questions, but do, does anyone want to have a crack at any of those things? I mean, I can take the, the sanctions. Yeah, okay, if, you go, so if, you, if you carry on and then, then we'll bring in Parvis, I think, if that's going. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, in terms of sanctions, I think, I think there are opportunities and there are various targeted sanction mechanisms that have been developed recently, such as the Global Magnitsky Act um, that was adopted here in the United States, but also in a number of other parliaments around the world at this point. And that allows governments to sanction individuals for either corruption, um, if there's evidence of them being linked to grand corruption or for gross human rights abuses. So I think there are various individuals within the, hum within the Tajik government who could be targeted, and I've been involved in some of the process of gathering evidence to, to various individuals who are, who are um, linked to both of those practices. And I think, you know, capital flight continues to be very important. The government and is, is uh, a kleptocracy, and where do they choose to hide their money? In most cases, it's in um, Western jurisdictions, um, tax havens in the United Kingdom's overseas territories, um, in some other cases in the United States and certain states um, that have more pervasive tax regimes. So I think there is still an opportunity um, to uh, sanction uh, the government of Tajikistan if that was an option that, that, that uh, Western governments wanted to, to go down. But of course, as, as you sort of allude to in your question, there are other emerging spaces in the uh, offshore financial world, um, including the United Arab Emirates and other places where we, we, we're already seeing capital flight moving in those directions and that could merely accelerate those processes. But there certainly, certainly are opportunities along with another tool that's been recently adopted by the United Kingdom government of uh, uh, targeted uh, unexplained wealth orders, which allows you to um, uh, take property, um, seize property from uh, or bank accounts for individuals who can't explain where that money came from. So I think there are various tools that we can use. Um, of course, their effectiveness is, 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 is debated, um, but I think 
you know that that's that's that that they're still tools we should consider using like Thanks, Ed. I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we recommend using the Nitsky sanctions and the overall recommendations of the project. I think one of the things we need, to, the UK can specifically do is tackle its uh, overseas territories, because there's a number of co companies that have uh, big roles in the Tajik government that uh, have, have companies that have, have, have uh, registered in the, in the Virgin Islands, I think, and, and, and various other parts of uh, the, the Caribbean that uh, under UK, uh, under the UK umbrella. I think, um, but I don't know if Shroyer wants to come in on this or the next but next question, but I think obviously the IFIs making sure that they are still putting in an enormous amount of money and don't, and other and other donors, um, you know, that with money comes the ability to make um, change around the edges. And, and I think the IFIs can particularly do, do a lot more. Uh, there's obviously trade-offs between development outcomes and human rights outcomes. And I think there was always a, the, the application tries to deal with some of those balancing challenges because Tajikistan is not only very repressive, it is very poor. And obviously, you know, the ability to do stuff to help make immediate change in people's lives versus trying to change some of the systems that are creating that poverty in the first place is is is, is a is a difficult trade-off. Um, but specifically in answer to Dick's question, what the UK can do, and I think obviously there are ongoing questions around UK the UK's ODA spend and the UK has had a had a significant role, significant but sort of mid middle tier role in uh, as a donor in Tajikistan. But also one of the things it can do, uh, we recommend in the publication, is to the uh, to add Tajikistan to its uh, uh, human rights uh, priority countries, uh, which it currently isn't, but uh, Uzbekistan and, and Turkmenistan are. So I think we can add add, add, add Tajikistan to that list. Um, does anyone else want to come in uh, on, on this one? Parvez, you, you turned your... Uh, you, your, your... Yes, uh, uh, very shortly. I think that uh, the uh, sanctions always the sanctions from the Western countries are always uh, limited by the uh, geopolitical interests of those countries, possible by the concern that if the sanctions will be imposed in a more completed form, uh, it could force local countries, not only Tajikistan, but also local Central Asian countries, to move closer to China. And it's already too much. I mean, already too much uh, uh, in debt to China which already we are uh, closing to the red line, after which there would be uh, not only economic, but political and uh, military dependency. And uh, as the Western countries understand that, they are very cautious in, uh, uh, with the imposing uh, uh, sanctions on uh, post-Soviet countries, not only Tajikistan. I think that's correct, but I think as China has inexorably taken that role into, and they are, it is making some of those countries more aware of quite how reliant they are on China, which again, gives opportunities for other partners to act as a balance. And I think that's, yeah, it's obviously- yeah. No, balance is very important. So we are really welcome you, uh, working countries to come and to balance situation, uh, but I think it's not enough now. No. And this, therefore, for instance, I, I personally, uh, in favor of joining uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, because this is the only way now today to balance uh, this uh, very strange geopolitical uh, geopolitical situation in Tajikistan in the region. Thanks. Put some limits on the China influence in the future. Okay, no, excellent, thank you. Um, does anyone else want to come in on this one or shall we skip to the second question? Okay, I, I think I think there may be some things that relate to that that uh, that, that could come in on this, on the next one. Uh, so from this is from Craig Oliphant, uh, who asks about uh, local civic activism spurred by the pandemic. Um, has this been countrywide or mainly around Dushanbe or one or two other places? And how much support have these activities managed to draw from the government or from international funding programs? Uh, and also any comments around the impact of COVID on the migrant workers' situation and the fall in remittances uh, from abroad. Um, I know Shoya wants to come in on that, and I'm sure Parvis has got some comments as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, regarding of uh, local civil activism um, activities during the pandemic, I would like to highlight that it was not only mainly around Dushanbe, uh, but also uh, I'm from uh, most part of Tajikistan, it's Sukh region. I saw that during that period, all the um, civil activists were local civil activists were very active. Uh, without waiting any kind of support from them, uh, government or international fundings, which is very, how to say, 
close one, uh, all the funds comes to, first of all, as I mentioned before, to the government. And we don't see the transparency and allocation with that money and funds. They find uh, with their own, uh, how to say, with their own optimists, they find a lot of um, independent businessmen, right? Independent funding for being helpful in this situation to the people. I saw a lot of their wonderful works around uh, providing supplies to the hospitals, around helping to the poor families, right? And uh, this was uh, amazing work. I have seen a lot of their publication around these issues and have seen uh, in social media a lot of uh, call for support and helping to each other, which was done by civil societies, like civil societies representatives. Regarding the impact of COVID, um, uh, absolutely all over the world, not only in Tajikistan, right? It impacts negatively to the migrant situation because it was terrible for them to stay uh, in Russia and not able to come. We have, you, you might see uh, the situation with the uh, uh, stranded people abroad. I was stranded as well for two months in Turkey while coming back to my own country. It was terrible. And uh, of course, uh, the situation with um, those who cannot go back to the Russia, for instance, to their work back and uh, have out of all their incomes and cannot provide them money uh, or breeding, cannot breed their family. It was a terrible situation. But at the same time, I saw a lot of projects which comes through for migrants work situation. Uh, for instance, from Internews, I have seen uh, migrant mobile projects, which helping to the migrants in a distance to deal with their, uh, to deal their issues, to uh, help them with the information, with the, a lot of some, such kind of issue. Thank you. Sorry, thanks, Shara. Um, oh, please. It's very, it's very actually covered uh, the, 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 the question. Uh, just said uh, just one point that uh, it was uh, for the first time uh, where in, when uh, uh, this civic activities wasn't concentrated in Dushama because we used to the situation that uh, the majority or only majority of professional NGOs are concentrated in, in the capital. So it was uh, the first phenomenon where, when which involved a wider number of people which never belonged to professional NGOs, never worked for them. Even where uh, the major, uh, the, uh, a considerable part of them have never been involved in civic activities. And uh, therefore, uh, 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 it covered not only Dushanbe, but many other regions of the, of the Republic. Plus, another uh, peculiarity is that uh, it, uh, uh, this activity was concentrated in the uh, social networks, uh, in the social media in internet uh, sector, Tajik segment of internet. Uh, and that's why uh, this phenomenon had uh, and has a cross border uh, uh, character. So it's covering the entire diaspora, it's covering the entire society. That's why it's not manageable. I mean, it's not, nobody can manage it from inside and nobody can control it from outside. Thanks, Pavis. Anyone else want to come in on this question? There was a question about the migrants. Yeah, that's just briefly also. Yeah. So the, first of all, uh, there was a drop of economic activities in Russia, where the majority of uh, uh, Tajik migrants were engaged. The COVID came too uh, sudden. Uh, it was a sudden phenomenon. That's why many people just stuck in Russia, uh, unable to get job, unable uh, unable uh, to find. Uh, to maintain jobs they had, unable to find uh, new jobs, unable to pay for the uh, uh, lodging, unable to pay for the living, uh, uh, using uh, more and more the savings. So the, the overwhelming uh, majority of migrants have found themselves in a very difficult uh, 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 situation. So they were just in, uh, didn't know, many of them didn't know what to do. Therefore, we saw that this phenomenon of self-organization of uh, this uh, diaspora, uh, which was one of the major factors of uh, uh, revitalizing, re re revitalization of the civil society. Uh, plus, uh, you should take into account that, uh, so 70% drop of uh, economic activities mean, means the 
eco uh, drop in uh, uh, the income, also eco, eco drops in uh, remittances, eco drops of uh, living standards of the population inside the country, their families, first of all, uh, almost equal rise of uh, prices inside the country. So it's a huge burden on not only the migrants, but their families, the society in general, and also the government. Yeah, and I think one of the things last year, obviously, the government got emergency funding to assist it during COVID. But uh, obviously, you've talked about the impact on family finances for that. You know, if the Russian economy doesn't bounce back in such a way that allows all those migrants to go back, you're you're not just having the acute problem that you're having now. It's a question of how, uh, so how many of those former migrant workers will be able to go back. And I think obviously if they're not all able to go back, it's going to be a, you know, a, an ongoing problem for the uh, for the Tajik government. Um, Dil, uh, uh, does anyone else want to come in on this one? Dil, have you got any comments? Uh, uh, yes, I just, uh, sorry, I just wanted to come in and say that we should look at the uh, labor migration also from uh, looking at the situation before the pandemic and also what happens now in terms of flows. Uh, the pandemic uh, gave uh, uh, Russia a new tool to control uh, the flaws and also uh, impose a pressure on the Taji government to enter, I guess, into Eurasian Economic Union, as Dr. Mulajanov has already said, because now the flaws are not just um, uh, prohibited by the, or restricted because of the lack of communication or restricted number of airlines, etc., but also by the new regime which is imposed on Tajikistan by Russian government. Now they want to uh, have an organized uh, recruitment of migrants starting from Tajikistan. So they are opening new centers in Tajikistan where migrants first will be assessed whether they're eligible, whether they can work in Russia, etc., and only then they will be sent there. So it's a general move into reduction of flaws, which started already before the pandemic. The same was with the remittances. So it's uh, the, uh, the drop in remittances was before the pandemic. And actually now I've seen yesterday the new assessment or estimation of the World Bank, which says that there was not as such a considerable drop in remittance and remittances as they have expected. It was just 1.9%. And according to Russian researchers who did uh, uh, an assessment of impact of COVID on uh, local population, on Russian nationals uh, or Russian population and migrants, they concluded that migrants were in better situation when we speak about employment because there was an increase uh, or increase of demand for their services. So they started to earn more and they started to send more home. And uh, for instance, the World Bank estimated that uh, through their listening to Tajikistan service, that there were there was a short period when uh, migrant families indeed has uh, suffered from uh, drop of remittances, but then it 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 changed quickly, and the, it also the poverty levels did not uh, uh, increase uh, as much as World Bank has expected. Uh, and again, uh, if we speak about uh, from situation of migrant workers from human rights perspective, we have came into conclusion as human rights people <laughs> that government has uh, not been able to deal with this crisis and provide adequate consular services even and uh, repatriation, um, uh, how to say measures, right? But at the same time, if we speak about people who were in the detention centers, in the temporary detention centers, who were already prepared for deportation, but were not able to do this, then the first steps which government did, it's not to praise, but it's just to say that uh, it was really to repatriate these people. Also, again, they were pushed by Russia because they didn't want to keep them there and give them medicine, etc. But if we look uh, in general, that majority of assistance which has been provided was through diaspora, was through human rights organizations in Russia, but not uh, with the cooperation with consular agent, consular services, of course, but not really by the government of Tajikistan. And um, uh, it was, and now, uh, if I can just uh, connect with the situation uh, at the kyrgyz tajik border, we see that Again, migrants became one of the most vulnerable. And again, the uh, service consular protection is almost not available for them. No, you're, you're absolutely right. There was, a, yeah, around the violence that uh, happened at the end of, end of last month, you've seen, you know, 
competitive expulsions on both sides of people who were um, you know, studying at universities and uh, in, in, more, in more vulnerable um, positions there. Uh, Ed, do you want to come in on, on, on that point at all? Or? I think it's been covered by everyone else. Excellent. Okay, great. Um, well, the next question, actually, um, um, Dilbar, uh, are you okay to, 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 to help take this as well? Uh, uh, talking about, yeah. from, from anonymous talk about, are women treated equally? But I think yeah. particular, mm -hmm. the particular point that they're raising is about um, discriminatory policies against people who wear the hijab. Um, yeah. And, and talking about a question, so, so does that mean, uh, so do women have the equal right to access to education or do other discriminatory policies against headscarves? Mm -hmm. And and, and and what support are local and international NGOs providing for women who are banned from attending universities and other education mm -hmm. settings? Uh, so uh, the question to the, the answer to the first question about treatment, I said from the very beginning, the question is no. Women are not treated equally. Uh, there are some direct discrimination in the laws. I just didn't want to go into details. You can read about decree in the publication. And there are the, in, a lot of indirect discrimination. And in reality, women are, and that it's my assessment as a gender expert, the situation is worsening uh, because the policy, uh, and it's linked also to hijab, is, make, is more traditional and uh, the focus is more nationalist. Also, this, um, because there, there is no formal uh, prohibition of wearing hijab. There is a, uh, a law or kind of even, it's not a law, it's an instruction which says that we should honor our traditional clothes. And there, is a, uh, there are pictures if you travel outside of Tajikistan, which, uh, or for instance, you go to the tax authorities, you could see there are posters uh, which show how women should be uh, covered and how men, which clothes men should uh, wear, which clothes women should wear. And uh, they, even when a woman is shown with a scarf, it's a traditional scarf like with what we wear in Tajikistan, which does not close your like surrounding of your face, but only close your hairs. Uh, so, and, and this, uh, and when there was uh, the discussion about hijab, there was exactly the reaction saying, why are we not speaking that European cloth is also not our traditional cloth and we are so tolerant towards it. So the government took this step to just prohibit non-traditional clothes, let's say, let's put it this way. And it's in line with the general trend, if we speak about gender equality, looking more into anti internationalist uh, perspective, right? They're connecting now situation of women more with their old national traditions rather than uh, like looking even from a secular perspective, I would say. So it's um, about the situation of NGOs, whether they, uh, I, I did not make any research about international NGOs, I can say only about local NGOs. Uh, again, there is no any study, but uh, in the you know, like conversations, uh, NGOs which work on gender equality and with women's rights, uh, they are in a way support uh, this uh, trend to suppress religion, because they perceive that um, race of religion uh, after the independence gave uh, a rise to these uh, violations of women's rights and to lowering status of women, which is very disputable to my point of view, but this is how they frame the narrative informally. It again does not, they do not speak formally. And um, there was also a discussion which I witnessed uh, in the uh, committee on elimination of um, all forms of discrimination against women in Geneva, where our delegation was asked explicitly about um, prohibition of women wearing hijab and entering the schools, etc., and also about women not allowed to pray together with men in the mosque. There was no any clear answer about this, and again, there was always a reference towards national traditions that uh, this is how we how we believe in Islam, this is how we practice, and we have a traditional clothes. Women are encouraged to wear traditional clothes. Why should we uh, like do something to push them to wear hijab or uh, to encourage them to do this. So there is, and there was no actually any response into them from the committee. Uh, it's, I think this is not uh, the issue which we widely discuss in Tajikistan, I must admit. But at the same time, we need to look broader into access to education because the wearing headscarves is not the only problem. Yeah, it's not a key problem. So we look more from a systemic perspective why girls are not allowed to go to school or by their parents or white traditions do not encourage them to per continue their education. This will be my short answer. <laughs> Sorry. Well, no, 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 it's, it's right. I mean, I think 
and you said there are other reasons. I mean, for example, if if the average age of marriage is just north, just just over twenty, you know, and, and expectations that you'll be having a family at that stage, obviously that creates problems for women going into university as well. But but you're right. It, it's it's this sort of na sort of secular nationalist uh, cultural approach to national identity in Islam that says you know no to short skirts and trousers and no to the hijab um, and it's you know a version of Islam that is nationalist and we see it across Central Asia actually that the thing the governments are promoting they are worried about increasing Islamization but they're also worried about increasing liberalization so the the approach is a focus on you know a particular cultural uh, you know, the, is, Islam as conservative culture rather than as professed faith and I think that's the um, that's 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 one of the sort of challenges that's not unique to Tajikistan. Um, anyone else want to come in on that? Well, we've got a couple more questions we need to get through before the end. Okay. Uh, in which case, there's a question from. Uh, I'll take question from Connor and then from Ian Milligan together. So there's, there's how much corporate Connor says how much cooperation is there between civil society organisations across national borders? And I think Troy wanted to come in on that. And Ian Milligan's talking about Russia and you know to what degree is Russia influencing uh, the political direction in Tajikistan? And is it in Russia's interest for Tajikistan to become a failed or, or disintegrated state? And we've heard a lot about the role of increasing role of China. But if anyone wants to come in on the role of Russia, um, either of those two sort of two question blocks that people want to come to. Shara, I know you had a point about- uh, Yeah, yeah, questions. I'm here. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Regarding both questions of Connor, how much cooperation is there between civil society and organization across national borders? I think it's uh, related to the recent issues uh, with the uh, conflict border with Kyrgyz and Tajikistan. And <clears throat> just from my, uh, from my perspective, from uh, us, uh, our civil society's uh, discussions panel, I can say that Currently, uh, a lot of civil society representatives made a lot of investigation, uh, traveled to that uh, place uh, and did a lot of investigation around that issue, around the conflict. And recently, one of the main other partners from, from Kyrgyzstan, Pradenio Kyrgyzstan, made a discussion panel uh, with uh, <clears throat> a negotiation of both sides, both civil societies. And it was very good. Uh, very sound discussions about the real situation because everyone see that information war which goes through the social media was terrible uh, particularly from Kyrgyzstan there was a lot of uh, fake news uh, fake, in fake information uh, from Tajikistan always is always hiding all the information not giving the proper information uh, besides of some some good mass media uh, providing information and therefore I think uh, right now civil society is making a lot of contribution while helping to that uh, families who lost their uh, family members or uh, who uh, face the damages and birth and etc they trying to help with the, a lot of uh, some kind of aid support right making uh, I don't know uh, chronology and documentaries uh, and everything and something like this however it was highlighted during the discussion panel that integration is important not between the civil society in this kind of national borders issues it should be integration between the government and civil societies in order to resolve these issues but as it was mentioned by other experts still the government uh, not too much pay attention to uh, this conflict as it should be uh, in our in a case of Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shara. Uh, anyone else want to come in on either of those two points? I think on, on Russia, um, although China's influence is rising quite dramatically um, across a number of different sectors in Tajikistan, I think Russia still wields tremendous influence over the country. Economically, it's still the largest um, largest, uh, at one point was the largest investor, I think now being overtaken by China, but certainly remittances make up a third of, of the economy. Um, in security terms, the, Russia still stations about 7,000 troops in Tajikistan, its largest base outside of, of the country with the exception of Syria, um, and it provides over 90% of the weapons to Tajikistan's army, along with various training, military exercises, um, and other, way, other forms of defense diplomacy. Um, we recently saw Rahman as the only foreign leader to attend the uh, May Day of May, May 8th, uh, Victory Day uh, celebrations May 9th in Moscow. 
Um, and so, you know, that was that was viewed as, as a sign of continued continued dialogue, particularly that coming after the recent border conflict with, with Kyrgyzstan. So I think Russia continues to have various levers of influence. I think there's this ongoing discussion over whether Tajikistan would join the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, I think there's still the Tajik side still waiting for certain concessions from Moscow um, before, before it accedes. That seems to be something that is likely to happen at some point. And in terms of the second question around disintegration, I think it's not in Russia's interest um, for a disintegration of the, the, the situation in Tajikistan. I think they're very interested in maintaining stability, um, particularly um, keeping keeping power within the, the hands of, of the current current regime. Um, so I think you know it's not in Russia's interest for the, the country to become destabilized. Um, Pavi Zordilba, do you want to come in on any of those? Uh, just uh, very briefly that uh, there are two leverages. Uh, I mean, the influence of Russia are important in two domains. One essential, first of all, because of migration, and, and second, in the security sector. Uh, uh, in a, so, um, uh, in terms of uh, economic influence, this is mainly because of migration. The dependency on Tajikistan and of Tajikistan on migration, and uh, as to the to this uh, security sector, it's going to be inf uh, increased uh, this dependency because after this conflict with Kyrgyzstan, we all uh, envisage uh, and expect uh, an arm race uh, in uh, uh, in the region, especially between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. We already know that uh, Kyrgyzstan has announced that he's going to organize two brigades. Uh, uh, equipped by the uh, Turkish uh, uh, arms. And I think that Tajikistan would be also more dependent on Russia and more dependent on some other countries' sources for recruitment and finances. Therefore, I'm um, quite probably that Tajikistan would join uh, the Eurasian Economic Union this year. No, thank, thanks, Pavis. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm just. We, we probably don't have time to get through the rest of the questions, but I, I note, uh, yeah, someone's asked a question about do Afghan affairs affect neighboring Tajikistan? Well, one of the, mm -hmm. one of the ways it all links in is uh, obviously Russia, we've talked, we've both at UNED talked about Russia's involvement, and that is one of the things that will potentially uh, go against uh, the US. You know, we saw going circulating the other week, the US was looking for a, a new base after leaving Afghanistan in Central Asia. I'd be interested to know whether people had any thoughts about whether that was going to end up in Tajikistan. That was listed as a country, but, it, but given Tajikistan's membership of the CSTO and its link to China, it seems slightly unlikely that they're going to go down that route. But uh, I, I, I'm willing to be corrected by people who know the minds of the US government better than me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that was, that was it, hopefully a brief answer to a, a Dick Rogerson's question, which is, uh, yes, Tajikistan and uh, Afghan affairs do very much affect uh, at Circles in Tajikistan, and there's some stuff on that in the, in the publication, both around some of the cross border linkages during civil war and uh, the situation you know, with um, the drugs trade and various other things that have come through and issues of radicalization. So, yes, there's a, a lot of stuff that's in the publication about that. Um, I don't think we have time for any more questions because we're probably going to uh, wrap up today. Uh, so, to let people know, obviously, please, if you haven't already done so, download the, uh, and read the um, publication that's on our website. Uh, the FPC will be holding a related event uh, jointly with Kabar Central Asia uh, on the 25th, uh, similar time uh, to today, where we're looking at issues around housing and urban development in uh, in Central Asia, where Zenia Moranova, who is one of the authors in this essay collection, will be presenting her findings that come out of this publication, as well as some other work. Um, and we will, yeah, so please, do, if you already haven't done so, uh, sign up to FPC's um, uh, email list so you can get um, information about that event and other events that we will have coming up. And thank you so much for sticking with us. And thank you so much to our panel, both for speaking today and for contributing. Hi, Shara. Good to, good to finally see you on screen. <laughs> finally. <laughs> well, thanks so much we've got, once again. We've got this AM. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Well, yeah. take care. And uh, thanks for thank joining us. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, bye. bye.